As You Like It by William Shakespeare. Act one, scene one, Oliver's Orchard. Enter Orlando and Adam. As I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion bequeathed me by will, but poor a thousand crowns, and as thou sayest, charged my brother on his blessing to breed me wealth. There begins my sadness. My brother Jacques, he keeps at school and reports speak goldenly of his profit. For my part, he keeps me rustically at home, or to speak more properly, stays me here at home unkept. For call you that keeping for a gentleman of my birth that differs not from the stalling of an ox? But I, his brother, gain nothing under him but growth, for the which his animals on his dunghills are as much bound to him as I. Besides this nothing that he so plentifully gives me, <laughs> the something that nature gave me, his countenance seems to take from me. He lets me feed with his hinds, bars me the place of a brother, and as much as in him lies, minds my gentility with my education. This is it, Adam, that grieves me, and the spirit of my father, which I think is within me, begins to mutiny against the servitude. I will no longer endure it, though yet I know no wise remedy how to avoid it. Yonder comes my master, your brother. Go apart, Adam, and thou shalt hear how he sh will shake me up. Now, sir, what make you here? Nothing. I am not taught to make anything. What mar you then, sir? <laughs> Mary, sir, I am helping you to mar that which God made, a poor, unworthy brother of yours with idleness. Mary, sir, be better employed and be not a while. <laughs> Shall I keep your hogs and eat husks with them? What prodigal portion have I spent that I come to such penury? Know you where you are, sir? Oh, sir, very well. Here in your orchard. Know you before whom, sir? I. Better than him I am before knows me. I know you are my eldest brother, and in the gentle condition of blood you should so know me. The courtesy of nations allows you better, my better in that you are the firstborn. But the same tradition takes not away my blood, or there are twenty brothers betwixt us. I have as much of my father in me as you, albeit I confess your coming before me is nearer to his reverence. What? Raising his hand. Boy. Seizing his brother. Come, come, elder brother, you are too young in this. But thou lay hands on me, villain. I am no villain. I am the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. He was my father, and he is thrice a villain that says such a father begot villains. Wert thou not my brother? I would not take this hand from thy throat till this other had pulled out thy tongue for saying so. Thou hast railed on thyself. Sweet masters, be patient for your father's remembrance. Be at a core. Let me go, I say. I will not till I please. You shall hear me. My father charged you in his will to give me good education. You have trained me like a peasant, obscuring and hiding from me all gentlemanlike qualities. The spirit of my father grows strong in me, and I will no longer endure it. Therefore, Allow me such exercises as may become a gentleman, or give me the pool for a lottery my father left me by testament. With that, I will go buy my fortunes. He releases Oliver. And what wilt thou do? Beg when that is spent? Well, sir, get you in. I will not long be troubled with you. You shall have some part of your will. I pray you, leave me. I will no further offend you than becomes me for my good. Get you with him, you old dog. Is old dog my reward? Most true. I have lost my teeth in your service. God be with my old master. He would not have spoke such a word. Is it even so? Begin you to grow 
upon me. I will physic your rankness and yet give no thousand crowns either. neither. Good morrow to your worship. Good Monsieur Charles, what's the new news at the new court? There's no news at the court, sir, but the old news. That is, the old duke is banished by his younger brother, the new duke. And three or four loving lords have put themselves into voluntary exile with him, whose lands and revenues enrich the new duke. Therefore, he gives them good leave to wander. Can you tell if Rosalind, the duke's daughter, be banished with her father? Oh, no, for the duke's daughter, her, her cousin, so loves her, being ever from their cradles bred together that she would have followed her exile or have died to stay behind her. She is at the court and no less beloved of her uncle than his own daughter, and never two ladies loved as they do. Where will the old duke live? They say he is already in the forest of Arden, and are many merry men with him. And there they live like the old Robin Hood of England. They say many young gentlemen flock to him every day and fleet the time carelessly as they did in the golden world. What? You wrestle tomorrow before the new duke? Merry do I, sir. And I came to acquaint you with a matter. I am given, sir, secretly to understand that your younger brother Orlando hath a disposition to come in disguised against me to try a fall. Tomorrow, sir, I wrestle for my credit, and he that escapes me without some broken limb shall acquit him well. The brother is but young and tender, and for your love I would be loath to foil him, as I must for my own honor if he come in. Therefore, out of my love to you, I came hither to acquaint you with all, that either you might stay him from his intentment, or brook such disgrace well as he shall run into, and that it is a thing of his own search, and altogether against my will. Charles, I thank thee for thy love to me, which thou shalt find I will most kindly requite. I had myself notice of my brother's purpose herein, and have by underhand means labored to dissuade him from it, but he is resolute. I'll tell thee, Charles, it is the stubbornest young fellow of France, full of ambition, an envious emulator of every man's good parts, a secret and villainous contriver against me, his natural brother. Therefore, use thy discretion. I had as lief thou didst break his neck as his finger. And thou were best look to it. For if thou dost him any slight disgrace, or if he do not mightily grace himself on thee, he will practice against thee by poison and trap thee by some treacherous device and never leave thee till he attain thy life by some indirect means or other. For I assure thee, and almost with tears I speak it, there is not one so young and so villainous this day living. I speak but brotherly of him, but should I anatomize him to thee as he is, I must blush and weep, and thou must look pale and wonder. I am heartily glad I came hither to you. If he come tomorrow, I'll give him his payment. If ever he go alone again, I'll never wrestle for prize more. And so God keep your worship. Farewell, good Charles. Now will I stir this gamester. I hope I shall see an end of him from my soul. Yet I know not why. It's nothing more than he. Yet he's gentle, never schooled, and yet learned, full of noble device, of all sorts, enchantingly beloved, and indeed so much in the heart of the world, and especially of my own people who best know him, that I am altogether misprized. But it shall not be so long this wrestler shall clear all. Nothing remains but that I kindle the boy thither, which now I'll go about. Scene two, the garden of the Duke's palace. Enter Rosalind and Celia. I pray thee, Rosalind, sweet my cause, be merry. 
dear Celia, I, I show more mirth than I am mistress of, and you were yet were merrier? Unless you could teach me to forget a banished father, you must not learn me how to remember any extraordinary pleasure. Herein I see thou loves me not with the full weight that I love thee. If my <laughs> uncle, thy banished father, had banished thy uncle, the duke my father, so thou hadst been still with me, I could have taught my love to take thy father for mine. So wouldst thou, if the truth of my love to me were so rightly, righteously tempered as mine is to thee. Well, I will forget the condition of my estate to rejoice in yours. You know my father hath no child but I, nor is none like to have. And truly, when he dies, thou shalt be his heir. For what he hath taken away from thy father perforce, I will render thee thee again in affection by mine honor i will and when i break that oath let me turn monster therefore my sweet rose my dear rose be merry from henceforth i will cause and and devise sports uh, let me see what do you think of falling in love Mary, I prithee do to make sport with all, but love no man in good earnest, nor no further in sport neither. Then with safety of a pure blush thou mayst in honour come off again. What shall be our sport then? Let us sit and mock the good housewife fortune from her wheel, that her gifts may henceforth be bestowed equally. I would we could do so, for her benefits are mightily misplaced, and the bountiful blind woman doth most mistake in her gifts to women. Tis true, for those that she makes fair, she scarce makes honest, and those that she makes honest, she makes very ill-favouredly. Nay, now thou goest from fortune's office to nature's. Fortune reigns in gifts of the world, not in lineaments of nature. Hmm, no. When nature hath made a fair creature, she may not by fortune fall into the fire. Though nature hath given us wit to flout at fortune, hath not fortune sent in this fool to cut off the argument? Indeed, there is fortune too hard for nature. When fortune makes nature's natural, the cutter off of nature's wit. Her adventure, this is not fortune's work neither, but nature's who... Perceiving our natural wit, too dull to reason of such goddesses, hath sent this natural for our whetstone. For always the dullness of the fool is the whetstone of the wits. How now, wit? Whither wander you? Mistress, you must come away to your father. Hmm, were you made the messenger? No, by my honor. But I was bid to come for you. Uh, where learned you that oath for? Stand you both forth now. <laughs> Stroke your chins and swear by your beards that I am a knave. Uh, by our beards, if we had them, thou art. <laughs> by my knavery, if I had it, then I were. But if you swear by that that is not, you are not forsworn. The more pity that fools may speak wisely what wise men do foolishly. By my troth, thou sayest true, for since the little wit that fools have was silenced, the little foolery that wise men have makes a great show. <gasps> Here comes Monsieur the Beau. Oh, with his mouth crammed full of news. Which he will put on us as pigeons feed their young. Well, then we shall be news crammed. All the better. We shall be the more marketable. Mm. Monsieur, Monsieur Le Beau, what's the news? Oh, fair princess, you have lost much good news. Or much good sport. Sport? Of what colour? What colour, madam? How shall I answer you? As wit and fortune will. Or as destiny's decree. <laughs> Well said. That was laid on with a trowel. Nay, if I keep not my rank. Thou losest thy old smell? You amaze me, ladies. I would have told you of good wrestling, which you have lost the sight of. Oh, yet tell us the manner of the wrestling. 
I will tell you the beginning, and if you please, your ladyships, you may see the end. Ooh. For the best is yet to do, and here, where you are, they are coming to perform it. Well, the beginning that is dead and buried. There comes an old man and his three sons. I could match this with the beginning with an old tale. Three proper young men of excellent growth and presence. With bills on their necks. Be it known unto all men by these presents. <laughs> the eldest of the three wrestled with Charles, the Duke's wrestler, which mm. Charles in a moment threw him and broke three of his ribs that there is little hope of life in him. So he served the second, and so the third. Yonder they lie, the poor old man, their father, making such pitiful dole over them that all the beholders take his part with weeping. Yes. <laughs> but what of the sport, monsieur, that the ladies have lost? This that I speak of. Thus men may grow wiser every day. It is the first time that ever I heard the breaking of ribs was sport for ladies. Or I, I promise thee. But is there any else longs to see this broken music in his ribs? Is, is there yet another dote upon rib breaking? Shall we see this wrestling, cousin? Oh, you, you must if you stay here, for here is the place appointed for the wrestling, and they are ready to perform it. Yonder, sure, they are coming. Let us now stay and see it. Come on, since the youth will not be entreated, his own peril on his forwardness. Is yonder the man? Even he, madam. <laughs> Alas, he is too young, yet he looks successfully. How oh, now, daughter and cousin? Are you crept hither to see the wrestling? I, my liege, so please you give us leave. Uh, you will take little delight in it, I can tell you. There are such odds in the man. In pity of the challenger's youth, I would fain dissuade him, but he will not be entreated. Speak to him, ladies, if you can move him. Call him hither, good Monsieur Le Bon. Uh, do, do so, I'll, I'll not be by. Monsieur the Challenger, the princess calls for you. I attend them with all respect and duty. Uh, young man, have you challenged Charles the Wrestler? No, fair princess, he is the general challenger. I come but in, as others do, to try him with the strength of my youth. Young gentlemen, your spirits are too bold for your years. You have seen cruel proof of this man's strength. If you saw yourself with your eyes or knew yourself with your judgment, the fear of your adventure would counsel you to a more um, equal enterprise. We pray you, for your own sake to embrace your own safety and give over this attempt. Do, young sir, your reputation shall not therefore be misprized. Uh, we will make it our suit to the Duke that wrestling might not, might not go forward. I beseech you, punish me not with your hard thoughts, wherein I confess me much guilty to deny so fair and excellent ladies anything. But let your fair eyes and gentle wishes go with me to my trial. Wherein, if I be foiled, there is but one shame that was never gracious. If killed, but one dead that is willing to be so. I shall do my friends no wrong, for I have none to lament me. The world no injury, for in it I have nothing. Only in the world I fill up a place, which may be better supplied when I have made it empty. The little strength that I have, I would it were with you. And mine to eke out hers. F fare you well. Pray heaven I be deceived in you. <laughs> Your heart's desires be with you. Um, where is this young gallant that is so desirous to lie with his mother earth? Ready, sir, but his will hath in it a more modest working. You shall try but one fall. No, I warrant your grace, you shall not entreat him to a second that have so mightily persuaded him from a first. Oh, you mean to mock me after? You should not have mocked me before. But come your ways. Now, oh, Hercules, be thy speed, young man. I would I were invisible to catch the strong fellow by the leg. They wrestle. Oh, excellent young man. If I had a thunderbolt in mine eye, I can tell who should down. Charles is thrown to the ground. 
No more. No more. Yes, I beseech your grace. I am not yet well breathed. How dost thou, Charles? He cannot speak, my lord. Uh, bear him away. What is thy name, young man? Orlando, my leash, the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. I would thou hast been son to some man else. Oh, the world esteemed thy father honorable, but I did find him still mine enemy. Thou shouldst better please me with this deed had thou descended from another house. But fare thee well. Thou art a gallant youth. I would that hast thou hadst told me of another father. Were I my father, cause would I do this? I am more proud to be Sir Roland's son, his youngest son, and would not change that calling to be adopted heir of Frederick. My father loved Sir Roland as his soul, and all the world was of my father's mind. Had I known before this young man, his son, I, I should have given him tears unto entreaties, ere he should have thus ventured. Gentle cousin, let us go. Thank him, and encourage him. My father's rough and envious disposition sticks me at heart. Sir, you have well deserved, if you do keep your promises in love, but justly, as you have exceeded all promise, your mistress shall be happy. Giving him a chain from her neck. Gentlemen, wear this for me. One out of suits with fortune that, that could give more, but that a hand lacks means. <laughs> Uh, shall, shall we go, cuz? Aye, fare you well, fair gentleman. Can I not say uh, I thank you? My better parts are all thrown down, and, and that which here stands up is but a quintain. <laughs> a mere lifeless block. He, he calls us back. My pride fell with my fortunes. I'll ask him what he would. Did you call, sir? Uh, so you, you, you have wrestled and, and overthrown more than your enemies. Will you go, cuz? Hmm? Uh, I have, have with you. Farewell. <laughs> what passion hangs these weights upon my tongue? I, I cannot speak to her, yet she urged conference. <laughs> Poor Orlando. Thou art overthrown, or Charles, or something weaker masters thee. <laughs> Good sir, I do in friendship counsel you to leave this place. Albeit you have deserved high commendations, true applause and love, yet such is now the Duke's condition that he misconsters all that you have done. The Duke is humorous, what he is indeed more suits you to conceive than I to speak of. I thank you, sir, and pray you tell me this. Which of the two was the daughter of the Duke that was here at the wrestling? Neither his daughter, if we be judged by manners. But yet, indeed, the taller is his daughter. The other is daughter to the banished Duke, and here detained by her usurping uncle to keep his daughter company, whose loves are dearer than the natural bond of sisters. But I can tell you that of late this Duke hath tamed displeasure against his niece grounded upon no other argument, but that the people praise her for her virtues and pity her for her good father's sake. And on my life, his malice against the lady will suddenly break forth. So fare you well. Hereafter, in a better world than this, I shall desire more love and knowledge of you. I rest much bound into you. Fare you well. Thus must I from the smoke into the smother, from a tyrant duke unto a tyrant brother, but ah, heavenly Rosalind. <laughs> Scene three, Duke Frederick's palace. Enter Celia and Rosalind. Why, cousin? Why, Rosalind? Cupid, have mercy. Uh, not a word. One to throw at a dog. No, thy words are too precious to cast away upon curs. Throw some of them at me. Come, lay me with reasons. 
there were two cousins laid up, when the one should be lamed with reasons and the other mad without any. But is this for your father? No. Some of it's for my child's father. Oh, how full of briars is this working day world. They are but burrs, cousin. Throw upon thee in holy day foolery. If we walk not in the trodden paths, our very petticoats will catch them. No, I, I could shake them off my coat. These burrs are in my heart. Hem them away. If I could cry hem and have him. Come, come, wrestle with thy affection. Oh, they take the better part of a wrestler than myself. Oh, a good wish upon you. You will try in time and despite of a fall, but turning these jests out of service, let us talk in good earnest. Is it possible on such a sudden you should fall into so strong a liking with old Sir Roland's youngest son? The Duke, my father, loved his father dearly. Doth it therefore ensue that you should love his son dearly? By this kind of chase, I should hate him, for my father hated his father dearly. Yet I hate not, Orlando. I hate him not, for my sake. Why should I not? Doth he not deserve well? Let me love him for that, and do you love him? Because I do. Look, here comes the Duke. With his eyes full of anger. Mistress, dispatch you with your safest haste and get you from our court. Me, uncle? You, cousin. Within these ten days, if thou beest found so near our public court as twenty miles of dias for it. I do beseech your grace. Let me the knowledge of my fault bear with me. If with myself I hold intelligence or have acquaintance with mine own desires, if that I do not dream or be not frantic, as I do trust I am not, then, dear uncle, never so much as in thoughts unborn did I offend your highness. Thus do all traitors, if their purgation did consist in words, they are as innocent as grace itself. Let it suffice that I trust thee not. Yet your mistrust cannot make me a traitor. Tell me whereon the likelihood depends. Thou art thy father's daughter, there's enough! So was I when your highness took his duke to... So was I when your highness banished him. Treason is not inherited, my lord. Or if we did derive it from our fathers, what's that to me? My father was no traitor. Then good, my liege, mistake me not so much to think my poverty is treacherous. Uh, dear sovereign, hear me speak. Aye, Celia. We stayed her for your sake, else had she with her father ranged away. I did not then entreat to have her stay. I was, it was your pleasure and your own remorse. I was too young that time to value her, but now I know her. If she be a traitor, why so am I. We still have slept together, rose at an instant, learned, played each together, and wheresoe'er we went like Juno Swan still, we went coupled and inseparable. She is too subtle for thee, and her, her smoothness and her, her very silence and her patience speak to the people, and they pity her. Thou art a fool. She robs thee of thy name, and thou wilt show more, more bright and see more virtuous when she is gone. Uh, eh? Open up thy lips. Firm and irrevocable is my doom, which I have passed upon her. She is banished. Pronounce that sentence then on me, my liege. I cannot live without her company. You are a fool. You, niece, provide yourself. If you outstay the time upon mine honor and in the greatness of my word, you die. Oh, my poor Rosalind. Whither wilt thou go? Wilt thou change fathers? I will give thee mine. <laughs> I charge thee, be not more grieved than I am. I have more cause. Thou hast not, cousin. I prithee, be cheerful. Knowst thou not the duke hath banished me, his daughter? That he hath not. No? Hath not? Rosalind lacks then the love which teaches thee that thou and I am one. Shall we be asundered? 
Shall we part, sweet girl? No. Let my father seek another heir. Therefore devise with me how we may fly, whither to go, and what to bear with us, and do not seek to take charge upon you, to bear our griefs yourself, and leave me out. For by this heaven, now at our sorrows pale, say what thou canst, I will go along with thee. Why? Uh, whither shall we go? Uh, to seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. Well, alas, what danger that will be to us, maids as we are, to travel forth so far. Beauty provokes thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire, and with a kind of umber smirch my face. The like do you, so shall we pass along, and never stir a savings. Were it not better, because I am more than common tall, that I did suit me all points like a man. A gallant kirtle axe on my thigh, a boar spear in my hand, and in my heart lie there what hidden woman's fear their will. We'll have a, a, a swashing and martial outside, as many other mannish cowards have, that do outface it with their semblances. What shall I call thee when thou art a man? Ah, ah. I, I'll have no worse name than Jove's own page, and therefore, look, you call me Ganymede. <laughs> but what will, you, what will you be called? Something that hath a reference to my state. Hmm. No longer Celia, but Aliena. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, but cousin, what if we essay to steal the clownish fool out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to our travail? He'll go along o'er the wide world with me. Leave me alone to woo him. <laughs> Let's away and get our jewels and our wealth together. Devise the fittest time and safest way to hide us from the pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now go in we content to liberty and not to banishment. Act two, scene one, the forest of Arden. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, and two or three lords dressed as foresters. <sighs> now, my co-mates and brothers in exile, hath not old custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp? Hmm? Are not these wolves more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we not the penalty of Adam, the season's difference, the, as the icy fang and churlish chidings of the winter's wind, which, when it bites and blows upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, <laughs> I smile and say, this is no flattery. Hmm? These are counselors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which like the toad, ugly and, and venomous, yet wears a precious jewel in his head. And this our life exempt from public haunt finds tongues in trees, books in the running brook, sermons in stones, and good in everything. I would not change it. Happy is your grace that can translate the stubbornness of fortune into oh, so quiet and so sweet a style. Come, shall we go and kill us some venison? And it yerks me that the poor dappled fools, being native burghers of this desert city, should in their own confines, with forked heads, have their rounded haunches gored. Indeed, my lord. The melancholy Jakes grieves at that. And in that kind swears you do more usurp than does your brother that hath banished you. <laughs> Today, I did steal behind him as he lay along under an oak whose antique root peeps out upon the brook that brawls along this wood, to the which place a poor sequestered stag that from the hunter's aim had ta'en a hurt did come to languish. And indeed, my lord, the wretched animal heaved forth such groans 
but their discharge did stretch his leathern coat almost to bursting, and the big round tears coursed one another down his innocent nose in piteous chase. And thus the hairy fool, much marked of the melancholy Jakes, stood on the extremest verge of the swift brook, augmenting it with tears. But what said Jakes? Did he not moralize this spectacle? Oh, yes, <laughs> into a thousand similes. First, for his weeping in the needless stream. Poor oh, dear, quoth he, thou makest a testament as worldlings do, giving thy sum of more to that which hath too much. Then, being there alone, left and abandoned of his velvet friend, tis right, quoth he. Thus misery doth part the flux of company. Anon, a careless turd full of pasture jumps along by him and never stays to greet him. I, quoth Jax, sweep on you fat and greasy citizens, tis just the fashion. Wherefore do you look upon that poor and broken bankrupt there? Thus most invectively he pierceth through the body of country, city, court, yeah, end of this our life, swearing that we are mere usurpers, uh, tyrants, and what's worse, to fright the animals and to kill them up in their assigned and native dwelling place. And did you leave him in this contemplation? Yeah, we did, my lord, weeping and commenting upon the sobbing deer. Show me the place. I love to cope with him in these sullen fits, for then he's full of matter. I'll bring you to him straight. Scene two, Duke Frederick's palace. Enter Duke Frederick with lords. Can it be possible that no man saw him? It, it cannot be. Some villains of my court are, are, are of consent and sufferance in this. I cannot hear of any that did see her. The ladies, her attendants of her chamber, saw her abed, and in the morning early they found the bed untreasured of their mistress. The roinish clown at whom so oft your grace was wont to laugh is also missing. Hesperia, the princess gentlewoman, confesses that she secretly o'erheard your daughter and her cousin much command the parts and graces of the wrestler that did but lately foil the sinewy Charles. And she believes, wherever they are gone, that youth is surely in their company. Send to his brother, fetch that gallant hither. If he be absent, bring his brother to me. I'll make him find him. Do this suddenly, and let not search and inquisition quail to bring these foolish runaways again. Scene three, outside Oliver's house. Enter Orlando. Who's there? What? My young master. Oh, my gentle master, oh, my sweet master, oh, you memory of old, sir, Roland, why, what make you here? Why are you so virtuous? Why do people love you? And wherefore are you gentle, strong, and valiant? Why would you be so fond to overcome the bonny prizer of the humorous duke? Your praise has come too swiftly home before you. Know you not, master, to some kind of men, their graces serve them but as enemies. No more do yours. Your virtues, gentle master, are sanctified and holy traitors to you. Oh, what a world is this, when what is comely envenoms him that bears it. Why, what's the matter? Oh, unhappy youth, come not within these doors. Within this roof, the enemy of all your graces lives. Your brother, no, no brother. Yet the son, yet not the son. I will not call him son, of whom I was about to call his father. <clears throat> Hath heard your praises, and this night, he means to burn the lodging where you used to lie, and you within it. If he fail of that, he will have other means to cut you off. I overheard him and his practices. This 
is no place. This house is but a butchery. Abhor it, fear it, do not enter it. Why, whither Adam wouldst thou have me go? No matter whither, so you come not here. What, wouldst thou have me go and beg my food, or with a base and boisterous sword enforce a thievish living on a common road? This I must do or know not what to do. Yet this I will not do, do how I can. I rather will subject me to the malice of my diverted blood and bloody brother. Oh, but do not so. I have 500 crowns. The thrifty hire I saved under your father, which I did store to be my foster nurse, when service should in my old limbs lie lame and unregarded age in corners thrown. Take that, and he that doth the ravens feed, yea, providently caters for the sparrow, be comfort to my age. Here is the gold, all this I give you. Let me be your servant. I'll do the service of a younger man in all your business and necessities. Oh, good old man. How well in me appears the constant service of the antique world, when service sweat for duty, not for need. Thou art not for the fashion of these times where none will sweat but for promotion, and having that, do choke their services up even with the having. But come thy ways, we'll go along together, and ere we have thy youthful wages spent, we'll light upon some settled low content. Master, go on, and I will follow thee to the last gasp with truth and loyalty. From seventeen years till now, almost four score, here lived I. But now live here no more. At seventeen years, many their fortunes seek. But at four score, it is too late a week. Yet, fortune cannot recompense me better than to die well and not my master's debtor. Scene four, the forest. Enter Rosalind in man's attire as Ganymede, Celia as a shepherdess, Aliena, and the clown Touchstone in the costume of a retainer. Oh, Jupiter, how merry are my spirits. I care not for my spirits if my legs were not weary. I could find it in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and cry like a woman. But I must comfort the weaker vessel as doublet and hose ought to show itself courageous to petticoat, therefore, Courage, good Ileana. I pray you, bear with me. I cannot go no further. For my part, I'd rather bear with you than bear you. Yet I should bear no cross if I did bear you. I think you have no money in your purse. Well, this is the Forest of Arden. Aye. Now I am in Arden, the more fool I. No, when I was at home, I was in a better place. But travelers must be content. I be so good touched on. Look you who comes here. A young man and old in solemn talk. That is a way to make her scorn you still. Oh, Corin, that thou knewst how I do love her. I partly guess, for I have loved her now. No, Corin, being old thou canst not guess, though in thy youth Youth, thou wast as true a lover as ever sighed upon a midnight pillow. But if thy love were ever like to mine, as sure I think did never man love so, how many actions most ridiculous hast thou drawn to by thy fantasy? Into a thousand that I have forgotten. Oh, thou didst not then never love so heartily. If thou remembered not the slightest folly that ever love did make thee run into, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not sat, as I do now, wearing thy hearer in thy mistress's praise, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not broke from company abruptly, as my passion now makes me, thou hast not loved. 
Oh, Phoebe. 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 Last poor shepherd, searching of thy wound, I have hard adventure found my own. And I mine. I remember when I was in love. We that are true lovers run into strange capers, but as all is mortal in nature, so is all nature in love mortal and fond. Thou speakest wiser than thou art aware of. Nay, I shall ne'er beware mine own wit till I break my shins upon it. Jove, oh, Jove, this shepherd's passion is much upon my fashion. And mine, but it grows something stale with me. Oh. I pray you, one of you, question yon gentleman if he for gold will give us any food. I faint almost to death. Hola, you, no, the he, clown. No, fool, he's not the kinsman. Who calls? Your betters, sir. Oh. Else uh, are they very wretched. Peace, I say. Good even to you, friend. And to you, gentle sir. <laughs> and to you all. I pity, Shepherd, if that love or gold can in this desert place by entertainment bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed. Here's a young maid with travel, much oppressed and faints for succor. Fair sir, I pity her and wish for her sake more than for mine own. My fortunes were more able to relieve her. But I am shepherd to another man and do not shear the fleeces that I graze. My master is of a churlish disposition and little wrecks to find the way to heaven by doing deeds of hospitality. Besides, his cot, his flocks, and bonds of feed are now on sale. And at our sheep coat now, by reason of his absence, there is nothing that you will feed on. But what is, come see. And in my voice, most welcome shall you be. What is he that shall buy his flock and pasture? Oh, that young swain that you saw here but erewhile, that little cares for by anything. I, I pray that if it stand with honesty, buy thou the cottage, pasture, and the flock, and thou shalt have paid to it for of us. And we will mend thy wages. I like this place, and willingly could waste my time in it. Assuredly, the thing is to be sold. Go with me, if you like upon report the soil, the profit, and this kind of life. I will your faithful feeder be, and buy it with your gold right suddenly. Scene five, the forest. Enter Amians, Jakes, and others, lords dressed as foresters. Amians has just finished a sad song. More, more, I pray thee, more. It will make you melancholy, Monsieur Jakes. I thank it. More, I prithee, more. I can suck melancholy out of a song as a weasel sucks eggs. More, I prithee, more. My voice is ragged. I know I cannot please you. I do not desire you to please me. I do desire you to sing. <laughs> Come, more, another stanza. I'll call you them stanzos. Uh, what you will, Monsieur Jakes. Nay. I care not for their names. They owe me nothing. <laughs> Will you sing? More at your request than to please myself. Well, then if ever I thank any man, I'll thank you. But that, that they call compliment it is like the encounter of two dog apes. And when a man thanks me heartily, <laughs> methinks I have given him a penny. And he renders me the beggarly <gasps> thanks. Come, sing. And you that will not hold your tongues. Well, I'll end the song. So it's covered the wild. The Duke will drink under this tree. He has been all this day to look you. And I have been all this day to avoid him. He's too disputable for my company. I think of as many matters as he, but I give heaven thanks and I make no boast of them. Come, warble, come. I'll give you a verse to this note that I made yesterday in despite of my invention. And I'll sing it. Thus it goes. If it do come to pass that any man turn ass, leaving his wealth and ease, a stubborn will to please, 
dukta me, dukta me, dukta me. Here shall he see gross fools as he, if he will come to me. What's that, uh, dukta me? Ah, <laughs> tis a Greek invocation to call fools into a circle. <laughs> Oh, I'll go sleep if I can. If I cannot, I'll rail against all the firstborn of Egypt. And I'll go seek the Duke. His banquet is prepared. Scene six, the forest. Dear master, I can go no further. Oh, I die for food. Here lie I down and measure out my grave. Farewell, kind master. Why, no, no, Adam. No greater heart in thee. Live a little, comfort a little, cheer thyself a little. If this uncouth forest yield anything savage, I will either be food for it or bring it for food to thee. Thy conceit is nearer death than thy powers. For my sake, be comfortable. Hold death a while at the arm's end. I will be with thee presently. And if I bring thee not something to eat, I will give thee leave to die. But if thou diest before I come, thou art a mocker of my labor. Ah, well said. Thou looks cheerly, and I'll be with thee quickly. If thou liest in the bleak air, come, I will bear thee to some shelter, and thou shalt not die for lack of a dinner if there live anything in this desert. Oh. Cheerly, good Adam. Oh. <laughs> Scene seven, the forest banquet. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, and lords like outlaws. I, I think he'd be transformed into a beast, for I, I can find him nowhere like a man. My lord, he is but even now gone hence. Here he was merry, hearing of a song. If he, compact of jars, grows musical, we shall shortly have discord in the spheres. Go seek him. Tell him I would speak with him. <laughs> <laughs> he saves my labor by his own approach. Why, how now, monsieur? <laughs> what a life is this that your poor friends must woo your company. What? You look merrily. A fool. <laughs> a fool. I, I met a fool in the forest. <laughs> a motley fool. A miserable world. As I do live by food, I met a fool who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. <clears throat> good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he, call me not fool till heaven hath sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with lackluster eye, says very wisely, It is ten o'clock. <laughs> Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more twill be eleven. And so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot and thereby hangs a tale. <laughs> oh, when I did hear the motley fool thus moral on the time, my, my lungs began to crow like chanticleer. <laughs> that fools should be so deep contemplative. <laughs> and I did laugh. Son's intermission, an hour by his dial. <laughs> oh, oh, noble fool. Oh, worthy fool. Motley's the only wear. What fool is this? A worthy fool. 
one that hath been a courtier, and says, if ladies be but young and fair, they have the gift to know it. <laughs> And in his brain, which is as dry as the remainder of a, a biscuit after a voyage, that he hath strange places crammed with observation, the which he vents in mangled forms. Oh, that I were a fool. I am ambitious for a motley coat. Thou shalt have one. <laughs> it is my only suit. Provided that you weed your better judgments of all opinion that grows rank in them, that I am wise. I must have liberty with all. As large a charter as the wind, for so fools have, to blow on whom I please. And they that are most gullied with my folly, they must most laugh. And why must they so, sir? The why is as plain as way to parish church. He that a fool doth hit very wisely, doth very foolishly, though he smart, if he seem senseless of the bob. If not, the wise man's folly is anatomized even by the squandering glances of the fool. Invest me in my motley. Give me leave to speak my mind, and I will through and through cleanse the foul body of the infected world, if they will patiently receive my medicine. Ah, oh, fie on thee. I can tell what thou wouldst do. But for a counter would I do but good. Oh, most mischievous foul sin and chiding sin, for thou thyself hast been a libertine, as sensual as the brutish thing itself, and all the embossed sores and headed evils that thou would, with license of free foot, hast caught, which thou disgorge into the general world. Why, who cries out on pride that can therein tax any private party? Doth it not flow as hugely as the sea till that the very weary means doth ebb? What woman in the city do I name when I say that the city woman bears the cost of princes on unworthy shoulders? Who can come in and say that I mean her when such a one as her, such a one is her neighbor? Or what is he of basest function that says his bravery is not on my cost, thinking that I mean him, but therein suits his folly to the metal of my speech? There then. How then? What then? Let me see wherein my tongue hath wronged him. If it do him right, then he hath wronged himself. If he be free, why then might taxing like a wild goose flies unclaimed of any man? But who comes here? Enter Orlando, Lord Drawn. Forbear and eat no more. Why, I've eaten none yet. Nor shalt not till necessity be served. What kind should this cock come of? Art thou thus emboldened, man, by thy distress, or else a, a rude despiser of good manners, that in civility thou seemest so empty? You touched my vein at first. The thorny point of bare distress hath tamed me from the show of smooth civility, yet I am inland bred and know some nurture. But forbear, I say. He dies that touches any of this fruit till I and my affairs are answered. And you not be answered with reason, I must die. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost died for food and let me have it. Sit down and feed and welcome to our table. Speak you certainly. Pardon me, I, I pray you. I, I thought that all things had been savage here and therefore put I on the countenance of stern commandment. But whate'er you are that in this desert inaccessible under the shade of melancholy boughs, lose and neglect the creeping hours of time. If ever you have looked on better days, if ever been where bells have knolled to church, if ever sat at any goodsman's feasts, if ever your, from your eyelids wiped a tear and know what is to pity and be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be, and, and, and which hope I blush and hide my sword. 
true is it that we have seen better days and have with holy bell been knolled to church and sat at Goodman's feasts and wiped our eyes of drops that sacred pity hath engendered and therefore sit you down in gentleness and take upon command what help we have that to your wanting may be ministered. Then but forbear your food a little while whilst like a doe I go to find my fawn and give it food. There is an old poor man who after me hath many a weary step limped in pure love till he be first sufficed oppressed with two weak evils, age and hunger. I will not touch a bit. Go find him out, and we will nothing waste till your return. I thank ye, and be blessed for your good comfort. Thou seest that we are not all alone, unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play. All the worlds, a stage. <laughs> and the men and women, merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and his shining morning face creeping like snail, unwillingly to school. <laughs> and then the lover, Sighing like a furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress. <laughs> Eyebrow. Then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like a pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice in fair round belly with good capon lined with eyes severe and beard of formal cut full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side. His youthful hose, well say, a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness in mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Enter Orlando with Adam on his back. Ah, oh, welcome. Here, sit down your venerable burden and let him feed. I thank you most for him. So had you need, I scarce can speak to thank you for myself. Welcome. F fall to, I, I will tell you as yet to question you about your fortunes. G give us some music, good cousin, sing. If that you were the good Sir Roland's son, as you have whispered faithfully you were, and as mine eye doth his effigies witness, most truly limbed and living in your face, be truly welcome hither. The residue of your fortune, go to my cave and tell me. Good old man, thou art right welcome as thy master is. Support him by the arm, give me your hand, and let all your fortunes understand. Intermission. Act three, scene one. Enter Duke Frederick and Oliver. Not seen him since, mm. sir. Sir, that cannot be. But 
Were I not the better part made mercy, I should not seek an absent argument of my revenge. Thou present, but look to it. Find out thy brother, wheresoe'er he is. Seek him with, with candle. Bring him dead or living within this 12 month, or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. Thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine worth seizure, do we seize into our hands till thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee? Oh, that your highness knew my heart in this. I never loved my brother in my life. Mm. More villain thou. Well, push him out of doors and let my officers of such a nature make an extent upon his house and lands. Do this expeditiously and turn him going. Scene two, enter Orlando with the paper. Hang there my verse in witness of my love, and thou thrice crowned queen of night survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above, thy huntress name that my full life doth sway. Oh, Rosalind, these trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thought I'll character that every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witness everywhere. Run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, the unexpressive she. <laughs> Scene three. The forest, enter Corin and Touchstone. And how like you this shepherd's life, Master Touchstone? Truly, shepherd, in respect of itself, it is a good life. But in respect that it is a shepherd's life, it is not. In respect that it is solitary, I like it very well. But in respect that it is private, it is a very vile life. Now, in respect that it is in the fields, it pleaseth me well, but in respect that it is not in the court, it is tedious. As it is a spare life, look you, it fits my humor well, but as there is no more plenty in it, it goes much against my stomach. Hast any philosophy in thee, shepherd? No more but that I know the more one sickens, the worst at ease he is. And that he that wants money, means, and content is without three good friends. That the property of rain is to wet and fire is to burn. That good pasture makes fat sheep and that a, a great cause of the night is lack of the sun. Uh, uh, that he that hath learned no wit by nature nor art may complain of good breeding, or comes of a very dull kindred. Such a one is a natural philosopher. Was ever in court, shepherd? No, truly. Then thou art damned. Nay, I hope. Truly thou art damned like an ill-roasted egg all on one side. For not being at court, your reason. Why, if thou wast never at court, thou never sawst good manners. If thou never sawst good manners, then thy manners must be wicked. And wickedness is a sin, and sin is damnation. Thou art in a parlous state, shepherd. Not a whit, Touchstone. Those that are good manners at the court are as ridiculous in the country as the behavior of the country is most mockable at the court. You told me, you salute not at the court, but you kiss your hands. That courtesy would be uncleanly if courtiers were shepherds. No, instance, briefly, come, instance. Why, we are still handling our ewes, and their fells, you know, are greasy. Why do not your courtier's hands sweat? and is not the grease of a mutton as wholesome as the sweat of a man? Shallow, shallow, a, a better instance, I say, come. Besides, our hands are hard. Your lips will feel them the sooner, shallow again, a more sounder instance, come. 
and they are often tarred over with the surgery of our sheep. Would you have us kiss tar? The courtier's hands are perfumed with civet. Oh, most shallow men. Thou worms meet in respect of a good piece of flesh indeed. Listen of the wise and prepend. Civet is of a baser birth than tar, the very uncleanly flux of a cat. Mend the instant, shepherd. You have too courtly a wit for me. I'll rest. Wilt thou rest damned? God help thee, shallow man. God make incision in thee. Thou art raw. Sir, I am a true laborer. I earn that I eat, get that I wear, owe no man hate, envy no man's happiness, glad of other men's good, content with my harm. And the greatest of my pride is to see my ewes graze and my lambs suck. See, that is another simple sin in you, to bring the ewes and the rams together and to offer to get your living by the copulation of cattle, to be a bawd to a bellwether and to betray a she-lamb of 12 months to a crooked, pated old cuckoldy ram out of all reasonable match. If thou beest not damned for this, the devil himself will have no shepherds. I cannot see else how thou should escape. Uh, here comes young Monsieur Ganymede, my new mistress's brother. From the east to western end, no jewel is like Rosalind. Her worth being mounted on the wind, through all the world bears Rosalind. All the pictures fairest lined are but black to Rosalind's. Let no face be kept in mind but the fair of Rosalind. I'll rhyme you so eight years together, dinner, suppers, and sleeping hours accepted. It, it is the right butter woman's rank to mark it. Out for... Oh, for taste. <laughs> if a heart do lack a hind, let him seek out Rosalind. If the cat shall, after kind, so be sure will Rosalind. Winter garments must be lined, so must slender Rosalind. Beast, you dull fool, I found him on a tree. Truly, the tree yields bad fruit. Oh, peace. Here comes my sister, reading. Stand aside. Why should this a desert be? For it is unpeopled. No, tongues I'll hang on every tree that civil shall civil saying show. Some how brief the life of man runs his erring pilgrimage that the stretching of a span buckles in his sum of age some of violated vows twixt the souls of friend and friend upon the fairest boughs or at every sentence end will i rosalinda ride teaching all that read to know the quintessence of every sprite heaven would in little shows therefore heaven nature charged that one body should be filled with all graces wide enlarged nature presently distilled helen's cheek but not her heart cleopatra's majesty atalanta's better part sad lucretia's modesty thus rosalind of many parts by heavenly synod was devised of many faces eyes and hearts to have the touches dearest prized heaven would that she gives these gifts should have and i to live and die her slave slave <laughs> oh most gentle jupiter what tedious homily of love have you wearied your parishioners withal, and never cried out patience, good people? Oh, now, back friends, a shepherd, go off a little. Go with him, Zero. Come, shepherd, let us make an honorable retreat, though not with bag and baggage, yet with scrip and scrippage. Hmm. Didst thou hear these verses? Oh. Yes, I heard them all, and more, too, for some of them had more feet in them than the verses would bear. Well, that's no matter. The feet might bear the verses. Aye, but the feet were lame, and could not bear themselves without the verse, therefore stood lamely in the verse. 
but didst thou hear without wondering how thy name should be hanged and carved upon these trees i was seven of the nine days out of wonder before you came but look here what i found on a palm tree i was never so berhymed since pythagoras's time that i was an irish rat which i can hardly remember how you who hath done this is it a man and a chain that you once wore about his neck oh change your color but you know i prithee who oh lord lord is it a hard matter for friends to meet but mountains may be removed with earthquakes and so encounter and neighbor who is it is it possible nay i prithee now with most petitionary vehemence tell me who it is oh who wonderful wonderful and most wonderful wonderful and yet again wonderful and after that out of all hooping <laughs> Good my complexion, dost thou think though I am apparelled like a man? I have a doublet and hose in my disposition. One inch of delay more is the South Sea of discovery. I prithee tell me who it is quickly and speak apace. I wouldst mm. thou could stammer that thou mightst pour this concealed man out of thy mouth as wine comes out of a narrow mouth bottle, either too much at once or none at all. I prithee take the cork out of thy mouth so that I may drink thy tidings. So you may put a man in your belly is he of god's making what manner of man is is his head worth a hat or his chin worth a beard nay he hath but a little beard why god will send more if a man will be thankful let me stay the growth of his beard if thou delay me not the knowledge of his chin it is young orlando that tripped up the wrestler's heels and your heart both in an instant nay but the devil take mocking speak sad and brow and and true maid by faith cause tis he orlando orlando <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, 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 alas, the day. What, 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 what will I do with my doublet and hose? What, what did he when thou sawest him? What, what said he? How looked he? Where and went he? What makes he here? Did he ask for me? No, where remains he? How parted he with thee? And when shall thou see him again? Answer me in one word. You must borrow me gargantuous mouth first. Tis a word too great for any mouth of this age's size. Mm. To say I or no to these particulars is more than to answer in a catechism yeah, but doth he know i am in this forest and in man's apparel looks he as freshly as he did the day he wrestled it is as easy to count autonomies as to re resolve the propositions of a lover but take a taste of my finding him and relish it with good observance i found him under a tree like a dropped acorn it may well be called jove's tree when it drops forth such fruit give me audience good madam proceed there lay he stretched along like a wounded knight there would be a pity to see such a sight it well becomes the ground cry holla to thy tongue i prithee it curvets unseasonably he was furnished like a hunter oh ominous he comes to kill my heart i would sing my song without a burden that brings me out of tune do you not know i'm a woman when i think i must speak sweet say on mm, you bring me out soft comes he not here tis he slink by and, and note him I thank you for your company, but good faith, I had as lief have been myself alone. And so had I, but yet for fashion's sake, I thank you too for your society. Well, God by you. Let's meet as little as we can. I do desire we may become better strangers. <laughs> I pray you no more, more, I pray you mar no more trees with writing love songs in their barks. I pray you mar no mo of my verses with reading them ill favoredly. Rosalind is your love's name. Yes, just. I do not like her name. Uh, there was no thought of pleasing you when she christened. Uh, what stature is she of? Just as high as my heart. Oh, you are full of pretty answers. <laughs> Have you not been acquainted with goldsmiths' wives and conned uh -huh. them out of rings? 
Not so, but I answer you right, Painted Paw, from whence you have studied your questions. Ooh, you have a nimble wit. I think twas made of Atalanta's heels. Will you sit down with me? And we too will rail against our mistress, the world, and all our misery. I will chide no breather in the world but myself against whom I know most faults. Well, the worst fault you have is to be in love. Tis a fault I will not change for your best virtue. I am weary of you. By my troth. I was seeking for a fool when I found you. <laughs> he is drowned in the brook. Look but in and you shall see him. There I shall see my own figure. Which I take to be either a fool or a cipher. I'll tarry with you no longer. <laughs> Farewell, good senor love. I am glad of your departure. Adieu, good monsieur melancholy. I will speak to him like a saucy lackey, and under that habit, play the knaves with him. Do you hear, Forrester? Very well. Uh, what would you? I pray you, what is the clock? You should ask me what time of day. There's no clock in the forest. Oh, then there's no true lover in the forest. Else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as the clock. <laughs> And why not the swift foot of time, had not that been as proper? Oh, by no means, sir. <laughs> time travels in diverse paces with diverse persons. Yeah, I'll tell you who time ambles with all, who time trots with all, who time gallops with all, and who he stands still with all. <laughs> I prithee, who doth he trot with all? Marry, he trots hard with a young maid between the contract of her marriage and the day it is solemnized. If the interim be but a said night, time's pace is so hard that it seems the length of a seven year. Uh, who ambles time withal? With a priest that lacks Latin and a rich man that hath not the gout. For the one sleeps easily because he cannot study and the other lives merrily because he feels no pain. The one lacking the burden of lean and wasteful learning, the other knowing no burden of heavy, tedious penury. These time ambles withal. Who doth he gallop withal? With a thief to the gallows. For though he go as softly as foot can fall, he thinks himself too soon there. Who stays it withal? With lawyers in the vacation. For they sleep between term and term, and they perceive not how time moves. <laughs> Where dwell you, pretty youth? Oh, with the shepherdess, my sister, here in the skirts of the forest, like fringe on a petticoat. <laughs> ah, are you native of this place? As the coney you see dwell where she is kindled. Your accent is something finer than you could purchase and so remove the dwelling. I, I have been told so of many, but indeed an old religious uncle of mine taught me how to speak, uh, who was in his youth an inland man. One who knew courtship too well, for though he fell in love. <laughs> uh, I, I, have, I have heard him read many, many lectures against it. And I thank God I'm not a woman to be touched with so many giddy offenses as he had generally taxed their whole sex with all. Can you remember any of the principal evils that he laid to the charge of women? Well, they were none principal. They were all like one another as half fence are. Every one fault seemed monstrous till his fellow fault came to match it. I pray thee, uh, recount some of them. No, I will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick. There is a man haunts the forest that abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, <laughs> hangs odes upon hawthorns, elegies on brambles, all forsooth defying the name of Rosaline. If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. Uh, I am he that is so love shaked. <laughs> I pray you, tell me your remedy. There is none of my uncle's marks upon you. So he taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes, I am sure you are not a prisoner. Uh, what were his marks? Uh, a lame cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not, but I pardon you for that, for simply your having a beard is a younger brother's revenue. 
then your hose should be ungarted, your bonnet unbandoned, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrement, as loving yourself and seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth, I would I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it? You may as soon make her that you love believe it, which I warrant she is apter to do than to confess she does. And that is one of the points in the which women still give the lie to their consciences, but in good sooth. Are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to the youth by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he. But are you so much... <laughs> But are you so much in love as, as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is uh, merely a madness. And I tell you, it deserves as well a, a dark house and, and a whip as mad men do. And the reason that they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. Yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes. Huh? One. And, and in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress. And I set him every day to woo me, at, at which time I would be a, but a moonish youth. You know, grieved, be effeminate, changeable, longing, liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconsistent constant, full of tears, full of smiles, but every passion something, and for no passion truly anything, as boys and women are for the most part, cattle of this colour, would now like him, would now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him, that, that I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook, nearly monastic. <laughs> and thus I cured him. And in this way, I will take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there will not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, you. I would cure you, if you would but call me Rosalind and come every day to my court and woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. <laughs> tell me where it is. Uh, uh, go with me, and I'll show you. And by, uh, by the way, you should tell me where in the forest you live. Will, will you go? Will all my heart, good youth. <laughs> no, <laughs> you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? <laughs> Scene four, the forest. Enter Touchstone, Audrey, with Jake's behind watching them. Come apace, good Audrey. I will fetch up your goats, Audrey. And now how, Audrey? Am I the man yet? Does my simple feature content you? Your features, Lord, warrant us. What features? I am here with thee and thy goats, as the most capricious poet, honest Ovid, was among the goats. Oh, knowledge ill inhabited, worse than Jove in a thatched house. When a man's verses cannot be understood, nor a man's good wit seconded with a fuller child understanding, it strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. <laughs> Truly, I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Is it honest indeed in word? Is it a true thing? No, truly, for thou swearest to me thou art honest. Now, if thou wert a poet, I might have some hope thou didst feign. W would you have me not be honest? No, truly, un unless thou wert hard favored, for honesty coupled to beauty is to have honey uh, sauce to sugar. A material fool. Oh, well, I am not fair, and therefore I pray that the gods make me honest. Truly, and to cast away honesty upon a, a foul slut were to put good meat into an unclean dish. I am not a slut. Though I thank the gods, I am foul. Praise be the gods for thy foulness. Sluttishness might come hereafter. But be it as it may, I will marry thee. 
And to that end, I have been with Sir Oliver Martex, the vicar of the next village, who hath promised to meet me in this place in the forest and to couple us. I would fain see this meeting. Well, the gods give us joy. <laughs> Amen. Scene five, the forest. And to Rosalind is Ganymede and Celia is Eliana. Never talk to me, I will weep. Do, I prithee, but yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? As good a cause as one would desire, therefore weep. His very hair is of the dissembling color. Something browner than Judas's. Mary, his kisses are Judas's own children. In faith, his hair is of a good color. An excellent color. Your chestnut was ever the only color. His kissing is as full of sanctity as the touch of holy bread. He hath bought a pair of cast lips of Diana, a nun of winter sisterhood, kisses not more religiously. The very ice of chastity is in them. Why did he swear he would come this morning and comes not? Nay, certainly there was no truth in him. Do you think so? Yes. I think he is not a pick purse nor a horse stealer, but for his verity in love, I do think him as concave as a covered goblet or a worm eaten nut. Not true in love. Yes, when he is in, but I think he is not in. You have heard him swear downright he was. Was, is not, is. Besides, the oath of a lover is no stronger than the word of a tapster. They are both the confirmers of false reckonings. He attends here, in the forest, on the duke, your father. I met the duke yesterday, and had much question with him. He asked me uh, of what parentage I was. I told him of as good as he. So he laughed and let me go. But what, what talk of we fathers when there's such a man of Orlando? Oh, that's a brave man. He writes brave verses, speaks brave words, swears brave oaths, and breaks them. Bravely, quite transverse, athwart the heart of his lover as a puny tilter that spurs his horse but on one side, breaks his staff like a noble goose. But all braves that youth mounts and folly guides. Who comes here? Mistress and master. You've oft inquired about the shepherd that complained of love who you saw sitting by me on the turf, praising the proud, disdainful shepherdess that was his mistress. Well, well uh, what of him? If you see a, if you will see a pageant truly played between the pale complexion of true love and the red glow of scorn and proud disdain, go hence a little and I shall conduct you if you will mark it. Oh, come, let us remove. The sight of love as feedeth those in love. Bring us to their sight, and uh, you, you shall say, I'll prove a busy actor in their play. Scene six, the forest. Enter Silvius and Phoebe. Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Do not, Phoebe. Say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. The common executioner, whose heart, though accustomed sight of death makes hard, falls not the axe upon the humbled neck, but first begs pardon. Will you sterner be than he that dies and lives by bloody drops? I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellest me there is murder in mine eye. Tis very pretty sure and very probable that eyes are the frailest and softest things who shut their coward gates on enemies to be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart. Now, counterfeit to swoon. Why now fall down? Or if thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame. Lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Now, show the wound my eye hath made in thee. Scratch thee but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean upon a rush, the cicatrice incapable and pressure thy palm some moment keeps. But now, mine eyes, which I have darted at thee, hurt thee not. Nor, I am sure, there is a not force in eyes that can do hurt. 
Oh, dear Phoebe, if ever, as that ever may be near, you meet in some fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrow make. But till that time, come near me not. When that time comes, afflict me with thy mocks, pity me not. As till that time, I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray you? Who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched? What, that you have no beauty, as by my faith I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed, must you be therefore proud and pitiless? Why, what means this? Why, why, do, you, why do you look on me? I, I see no more in you than the ordinary of, of nature's scale work. Oh, my little like I think she means to tangle my eyes too. No! Faith, proud mistress, hope not for it. It is not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheeks of cream that can attain my spirits to your worship. You, foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her like foggy south, puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a properer man than she a woman. Tis fools as you that makes the world full of, world full of ill-favoured children. Tis not her glass that flatters you, but her. And out of you she sees herself more proper than of any of her lineaments can show her. But mistress, know yourself. Down on your knees and thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, and friendly, in your ear, sell when you can. You're not for all markets. <laughs> Cry the man mercy, love him, take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. So take her to thee, shepherd, fare you well. Sweet youth, I pray you chide a year together. I'd rather hear you chide than this man woo. He's, he's fallen in love with your foulness, and she's fallen in love with my anger. If it be so, as, as fast as she answers these with frowning looks, I'll source her with bitter words. Why? Look you on me, so. For no ill will I bear you. I pray you do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than bowels made in wine. Besides, I like you not. If, Silvius, if, if you will know my house, tis at the tuft of olives, here hard by, will you go, sister, shepherd, ply her hard. Come, sister, shepherdess, look on him better and be not proud, though all the world could see. None could be so abused in sight as, as he. Come, come to our flock. <laughs> Dear shepherd, now I find thy saw of might, whoever loved that loved not at first sight. Sweet Phoebe. Huh? What sayest thou, Silvius? Sweet Phoebe, pity me. Why, I am sorry for thee, gentle Silvius. Wherever sorrow is, relief would be. If you do sorrow at my grief in love, by giving love your sorrow and my grief, we're both extermined. Thou hast my love. Is not that neighborly? I would have you. <laughs> Why, that were covetousness. Silvius, the time was that I hated thee, and yet it is not that I bear thee love. But since that thou canst talk of love so well, thy company, which erst was irksome to me, I will endure, and I'll employ thee too. But do not look for further recompense than mine own gladness thou art employed. So holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such a poverty of grace, that I shall think it a most plenteous crop to glean the broken ears after the man that the main harvest reaps. Loose now, and loose now and then a scattered smile, and that I'll live upon. Knowest the youth that spoke to me erewhile? Not very well, but I have met him oft, and he hath bought the cottage and the bounds that the old harlot was once master of. Think not that I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but, <laughs> tis but a peevish boy, yet he talks well. <laughs> but what care I for words? Yet words do well when he speaks them, pleases that here. It is a pretty youth, <laughs> but not very pretty. But sure, he's proud, and yet his pride becomes him. He'll make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion, and, and faster than his tongue did make offense, his eye did heal it up. He is not very tall. 
yet for his years he's tall his leg is you know, so so and yet just well <laughs> there was a pretty redness in his lip a little riper and more lusty red than the mixed in his cheek which was just the difference betwixt the constant red and the niggled damask there be some women sylvius had they marked him in parcels as i did would have gone near to fall in love with him but for my part i love him not but nor hate him not and yet i have more cause to hate him than to love him for what did he to chide at me he said mine eyes were black and my hair black and now I'm remembered, scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again. But that's all one. Omittance is no quittance. I'll write him a very taunting letter. And thou shalt bear it. What thou, Silvius? Phoebe, with all my heart. I'll write it straight. The matter's in my hand and in my heart. I will be bitter with him and passing short. Go with me, Silvius. Act four, scene one, the forest. Enter Rosalind as Ganymede, and Celia as Eliana and Jates. I prithee, pretty youth, let me be better acquainted with thee. They say you are a melancholy fellow. I am so. <laughs> I do love it better than laughing. Those that are in extremity of either are abominable fellows, and they betray themselves to every modern censure worse than drunkards. Why? Tis good to be sad and say nothing. Why then, tis good to be opposed. <laughs> I have neither the scholar's melancholy, which is emulation, nor the musician's, which is fantastical, nor the courtier's, which is proud, nor the soldier's, which is ambitious nor the lawyers, which is politic, nor the ladies, which is nice, nor the lovers, which is all of these, but it is a melancholy of mine own, compounded of many simples, extracted from many objects. And indeed, the sundry contemplation of my travels, in which my often rumination wraps me in a most humorous sadness. A traveler. By my faith, you have great reason to be sad. I fear you sold your own lands to see other men's, than to have seen much and have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. Yes, I have gained my experience. And your experience makes you sad. I'd rather have a fool to make me merry than experience to make me sad, and to travel for it too. Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. Nay, then, God be with you, and you speak in blank verse. Farewell, Monsieur Traveller. Look, you lisp, and wear strange suits. Disable all the benefits of your own country. Be out of love with your nativity, and almost chide God for making you that countenance you are. Or I will scarce think you have so. I'm in a gondola. <sighs> Why, how now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You a lover, and you serve me such another trick? <sighs> Never come in my sight again. My fair Rosalind, I come within an hour of my promise. Oh, oh break an hour's promise in love? He that will divide a minute into a thousand parts and break but a part of the thousandth part of a minute in the affairs of love, it may well be said of him that Cupid hath clapped him over the shoulder, but I'll warrant him wholehearted. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. Nay, and you be so tardy. Come no more in my sight. I'd been leaf wooed of, of a snail. Of a snail? Aye, of a, a snail. For though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his back. A better jointure, I think, than you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. Oh, what's that? Uh, why, horns, which such you are fain to be holden to your wives for. But he comes armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his wife. Virtue is no horn maker, and my Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. It pleases him to call you so, but he hath a Rosalind of a better leer than you. Come, come, woo me, woo me, for now I am in a, a holiday humor and like enough to consent. 
what would you say to me now and I were your very, very Rosalind? I would kiss before I spoke. Nay, you were better speak first. And when you were graveled for lack of matter, you might take the occasion to kiss. Very good orators when they are out, they will spit. And for lovers, lacking, God warrant us, matter, the cleanliest shift is to kiss. How if the kiss be denied? Then she puts you to entreaty and there begins a new matter. Who could be out being before his beloved mistress? Marry, that should you if I were your mistress, or I should think my honesty ranker than my wit. Uh, what, of my suit? Uh, no, not out of your apparel, and yet out of your suit. Am, am, am I not your Rosalind? I take some joy to say that you are, because I would be talking of her. <laughs> well, in her person. I say I will not have you. Then in my own person I die. No, Faith, by, die by attorney. The, the poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time, there was not any man died in his own person, vitalict in a love course. Troilus had his brains dashed out with the Grecian club, yet he did what he could to do die before. He is one of many patterns of the love. Leander, he would have lived many a year, though Hero had turned none, if it had not been for a hot midsummer night, for, good youth, he went forth to wash him in the hell's pond, and being taken with the cramp, was drowned, and the foolish chroniclers of that age found it was a Hero of Cestus. But these are all lies. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. I would not have my right, Rosalind, of this mind, for I protest her frown might kill me. By this hand, it will not kill a fly. But come, now I will be your Rosalind in a more coming on disposition, uh, and ask me what you will, I will grant it. Uh, and then love me, Rosalind. Yes, Faith, I will, Fridays and Saturdays and all. <laughs> and wilt thou have me? Ay, and twenty such. What sayest thou? Are you not good? I hope so. Why then can one desire too much of a good thing? Come, sister, you shall be the priest and marry us. Give me your hand, Orlando. What do you say, sister? I pray thee, marry us. I cannot say the words. You must begin, will you, Orlando? Go to. Uh -huh. Will you, Orlando, have to wife this, Rosalind? I will. I, but when? Uh, why, now, as fast as she can marry us. Then you must say, I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I might ask you for your commission, but I do take thee, Orlando, for my husband. There's a girl goes before the priest, and certainly a woman's thought runs before her actions. <laughs> so do all thoughts, and they are winged. Now, uh, tell me, how long would you have her after you possessed her? Uh, forever and a day. <laughs> mm, say day without the ever. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wise. I will be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his hen, more clamorous than a parrot against rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. I will weep for nothing like Diana in the fountain, and I will do that when you are disposed to be merry. I will laugh like a hyena, and that when thou art inclined to sleep. But will my Rosalind do so? Uh, by my life, she will do as I do. Oh, but she is wise. Or else she could not have the wit to do this. The wiser, the waywarder. Make the doors upon a woman's wit, and it will out at the casement. Shut that, twill out at the keyhole. Stop that, twill fly with the smoke out the chimney. A man that had a wife with such a wit, he might say, wit with or wilt. <laughs> Nay, you might keep that in check, for till you meet your wife's wit going to your neighbor's bed. And what wit could wit have to excuse that? Uh, married to say she came to seek you then? You shall never take her without an answer unless you take her without a tongue. Oh, that woman that cannot make her fault her husband's occasion, let her never nurse herself, for she will breed it like a fool. 
for these two hours, Rosalind, I will leave thee. Alas, dear love, I cannot lack thee two hours. I must attend the Duke at dinner. By two o'clock, I will be with thee again. I go your ways, go your ways. And I, I knew what you would prove, my friend told me as much. <laughs> and I thought no less. To that flattering tongue of, you, tongue of yours won me. But one cast away. And so, come death. Two o'clock is your hour. Aye, sweet Rosalind. By my troth and in good earnest, and so God mend me, by all the pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise, or come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetical break promise, the most what? hollow lover, the most unworthy of her you call Rosalind, that may be chosen out of the gross band of the unfaithful. Therefore beware my censure and keep your promise. With no less religion than if thou wert indeed my Rosalind. Well, so, time is the old justice that examines all such offenders, and let time try. And do you? <laughs> you have misused our sex with your love for it. We must have your doublet and hold plucked over your head, and show the world what the bird hath done to her own nest. Oh, cuz, 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 my pretty little cuz, that thou didst know how many fathom deep I am in love. But it cannot be sounded. My affection hath an unknown bottom like the Bay of Portugal. Or rather bottomless. That as fast as your poor affection in, it runs out. No, that same wicked bastard of Venus that was begot of thought, conceived of spleen, and born of madness, that blind, rascally boy that abuses everyone's eyes because his own are out, let him be the judge of how deep I am in love. I'll tell thee, Eliana, I cannot be out of sight of Orlando. I'll go find a shadow and sigh till he come. And I'll sleep. Mm. Scene three, the forest. And to Rosalind as Ganymede and Celia as Eliana. How say you now? Is it not past two o'clock and here much, Orlando? I warrant you, with pure love and troubled brain, he hath taken his bow and arrows and is gone forth to sleep. Look who comes here. My errand is to you, fair youth. Uh, my gentle Phoebe did bid me give you this. I know not the contents, but, as I guess by the stern brow and waspish action which she did use as she was writing of it, it bears an angry tenor. Uh, pardon me, I am but as a guiltless messenger. Patience herself would startle at this letter and play the swagger, bear this, bear all. She says, I am not fair, that I lack manners. She calls me uh, proud and that she could not love me were man as rare as Phoenix. Oh, my will. Her love is not the hair that I do hunt. Why writes she so to me? Well, Shepard? Well, th this is a letter of your own device. No, I protest. I know not the contents. Phoebe did write it. Oh, come, come. You're a fool and turned into the extremity of love. I say she never did invent this letter. This is a man's intention and his hand. Sure, it is hers. Mike is a boisterous and cruel style. A style for challenges. You know, will you hear the letter? So please you, for I never heard it yet. Yet heard too much of Phoebe's cruelty. Or well, she Phoebe's me. Mark how the tyrant writes. Art thou God to shepherd turned that a maiden heart hath burned? Can, can a woman rail thus? Call you this railing? Why, the God he'd laid apart wast thou with a woman's heart. Did you ever hear such railing? Whilst the eye of man did woo me that could do no vengeance to me, meaning me, a beast. If the scorn of your bright eyne have power to raise such love in mine, a lack in me what strange effect would they work in mild aspect? Whilst you chide me, I did love. How then might your prayers move? He that brings this love to thee little knows this love in me. And by him seal up thy mind, whether that thy youth and kind will the faithful offer take of me, 
and all that I can make, or else by him my love deny, and then I'll study how to die. Call you this chiding? Alas, poor shepherd. Do you pity him? No, no, no. He deserves no pity. Wilt thou love such a woman? What, to make thee an instrument and play false strains upon you? Not to be endured. Well, go your way to her, for I see love hath made thee a tame snake. And say this to her, that if she love me, I charge her to love thee. If she will not, I will never have her, unless thou entreat for her. If you be a true lover, hence, and not a word, for, well, for here comes more company. Good morrow, fair ones. Pray you, if you know where in the pillars of this forest stands a, a sheep coat fenced about with olive trees? West of this place, down in the neighbor bottom, the rank of osiers by the murmuring stream, left on your right hand, brings you to the place. But at this hour the house doth keep itself. There's none within. If that an eye may profit by a tongue, then should I know you by description? Such garments and such years? The boy is fair, of female favor, and bestows himself like a ripe sister. The woman low and browner than her brother? Are not you the owners of the house I did inquire for? It is no boast, being asked. To say we are. Orlando doth commend him to you both, and to that youth he calls his Rosalind, he sends this bloody napkin. Are you he? I am. What must we understand by this? Some of my shame, if you will know of me what man I am, and how and why and where this handkerchief was stained. I pray you tell it. When last the young Orlando parted from you, he left a promise to return again within an hour, and pacing through the forest, chewing the food of sweet and bitter fancy, lo, what befell. He threw his eye aside, and mark what object did present itself, under an old oak, whose boughs were mossed with age, and high top bald with dry antiquity. A wretched ragged man, o'ergrown with hair, lay sleeping on his back. About his neck a green and gilded snake had wreathed itself, who with her head nimble in threats approached the opening of his mouth. But suddenly, seeing Orlando, it unlinked itself and with indented glides did slip away into a bush, under which bushes shade a lioness with udders all drawn dry, lay couching head on ground with cat-like watch when the sleeping man should stir. For it is the royal disposition of that beast to prey on nothing that did seem as dead. This scene, Orlando did approach the man and found it was his brother, his elder brother. Oh, I have heard him speak of that same brother. And he did render him the most unnatural that lived amongst men. And well he might do so, for well I know he was unnatural. Uh, but to Orlando, did, did he leave him there? Food to the sucked and hungry lioness? <laughs> Twice did he turn his back and purposed so, but kindness, nobler ever than revenge, and nature, stronger than his just occasion, made him give battle to the lioness who quickly fell before him, in which hurtling from miserable slumber I await. Are, are, are you his brother? Was you he rescued? Was you that did so oft contrive to kill him? "'Twas I, but tis not I. "'I do not shame to tell you what I was, "'since my conversion so sweetly tastes, "'being the thing I am.'" "'But what for the bloody napkin?' "'By and by. "'When from the first to last betwixt us two, "'tears harbor countenance and most kindly bathe, "'as how I came into that desert place. "'In brief, he led me to the gentle duke, "'who gave me fresh array and entertainment, "'committing me unto my brother's love, who led me instantly unto his cave. There stripped himself, and here, upon his arm, the lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled, and now he fainted and cried in fainting upon Rosalind. Brief, I, I recovered him, bound up his wound, and after some small space, being strong at heart, he sent me hither, stranger as I am, to tell this story that you might excuse his broken promise, and to give this napkin dyed in this blood unto the shepherd youth that he in sport doth call his Rosalind. 
Rosalind faints. Uh, oh, why? <laughs> How now? Uh, Ganymede! Sweet Ganymede! But many will swoon when they do look on blood. There is more in it. Cousin! Ganymede! Look, he recovers. I would I were at home. We'll lead you thither. I pray you, will you take him by the arm? Be of good cheer, youth. You a man. You lack a man's heart. I, I, I do so, I confess it. <laughs> ah! Sirrah, body would think this is well counterfeited. I pray you, tell your brother how well I counterfeited high home. Hmm. This was not counterfeit. There is too great testimony in your complexion that it was a passion of earnest. Counterfeit, I assure you. Well, then, take a good heart and counterfeit to be a man. So I do, but in faith, I should have been a woman by rank. <laughs> Come, <laughs> you look paler and paler. Uh, pray you, draw homewards, good sir. Go with us. That will I. For I must answer back how you excuse my brother, Rosalind. I, I shall devise uh, something, but I, I pray you commend my counterfeiting to him. Will you go? Act five, scene one, the forest. Enter Touchstone and Audrey. We shall find a time, Audrey. Patience, gentle Audrey. Faith, the priest was good enough for all the gentlemen saying. The most wicked Sir Oliver, Audrey, a most vile Martex. But Audrey, there is a youth here in the forest that lays claim to you. Oh. I, I know who it is, but he has no interest in me in the world. But here comes the man you mean. <laughs> it is meat and drink for me to see a clown on my troth. We that have good wits have much to answer for. We shall be flouting. We cannot hold. Good evening, Audrey. God, you good evening, William. And good evening to you, sir. Give me your hand. Art thou learned? No, sir. Then learn this of me. To have is to have. For it is a figure of rhetoric that drink being poured out of a cup into a glass by filling one doth empty the other. For all you writers do content that Ipso is he. Now you are not Ips he, for I am he. Uh, which he, sir? He, sir, that must marry this woman. Therefore you, clown, abandon, which is the vulgar leave, the society, which is in the boorish company of this female, which is in the common woman, which together is abandon the society of this female, or the clown, thou perishest, or to make better understanding, diest, or to wit, I kill thee, make thee away, translate thy life into death, thy liberty into bondage, I will deal in poison, with thee, or in bastinado, or in steel, I will bandy with thee in faction, I will o'errun thee with policy, I will kill thee a hundred and fifty ways, therefore tremble and depart. Do. Good, William. God rest you, Mary, Stark. Oh, our master and mistress seeks you. Come away, away. Dude, trip, Audrey, trip. Audrey, I, I attend. I, I attend. Scene two, the forest. Enter Orlando and Oliver. It's possible that on so little acquaintance you should like her, that but seeing you should love her and loving, woo and wooing she should grant. And will you persevere to enjoy her? Neither call the giddiness of it in question, the poverty of her, the small acquaintance, my sudden wooing, nor her sudden consenting. But say, with me, I love Aliena. Say with her that she loves me. Consent with both that we may enjoy each other. 
but you'll be to your good for my father's house and all the revenue that was old Sir Roland's will I estate upon you and here live and die a shepherd. You have my consent. Uh, let your wedding be tomorrow. Thither will I invite the Duke and all's contended followers. Go you, prepare Aliena for the few. Here comes my Rosalind. God save you, brother. And you, fair sister. Oh, my dear Orlando, it, how it grieves me to see thee wear thy heart in a scarf. Uh, it is my arm. <laughs> I thought thy heart had been wounded with the claws of a lion. Wounded it is, but with the eyes of a lady. Did your, did your brother tell you how I counterfeited too soon when he showed me, me your handkerchief? I and greater wonders than that. Oh, I know where you are. Nay, it is true, it was never anything so sudden, but the fight of two rams and Caesar's personical brag of I came and saw and overcome, for your brother and my sister no sooner met, but they looked. No sooner looked, but they loved. No sooner loved, but they sighed. No sooner sighed, but they asked one another the reason. No sooner they knew the reason, but they sought the remedy. And in this degree, they have made a pair of stairs to marriage, which they will climb incontinent, or else be incontinent before marriage. They are in the very wrath of love, and they will together, clubs cannot part them. Uh, they shall be married tomorrow, and I will bid the duke to the nuptial. But, oh, how bitter it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes. I, why so much the more shall I tomorrow be at the height of heart heaviness by knowing how much I think my brother happy in having what he wishes for. Why then tomorrow I cannot serve your turn for Rosalind? I can live no longer by thinking. I will weary you then, no longer with idle talking. Know of me then, for now I speak to some purpose, that I know you're a gentleman of good conceit. I speak not this, that you should bear a good opinion of my knowledge, in so much I say I, I know you are. Neither do I labor for a greater esteem than it may in some little measure draw belief from you to do yourself good and not to grace me. Just <laughs> believe then, if you please, that I can do strange things. I, I have, since I was three years old, conversed with a magician, uh, most profound in his art, and yet damnable. If you do love Rosalind, so near your heart as your jester cries out. When your brother marries Eliana, shall you marry her? I know into what straits of fortune she is driven, and it is not impossible to me, if it appear not inconvenient to you, to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human as she is and without any danger. Speaks thou in sober meanings. By my life, which I tender dearly. Though I say I'm a magician, therefore, Put you in your best array, bid your friends. For if you will be married tomorrow, you shall. And to Rosalind, you will. <laughs> oh, look, here comes a lover of mine and a lover of hers. Youth, you have done me much ungentleness to show the letter that I writ to you. I care not if I have. It is my study to seem despiteful and ungentle to you. You are there followed by a faithful shepherd. Look upon him. Love him. He worships you. Good shepherd, tell this youth what tis to love. It is to be all made of sighs and tears, and so I am for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be all made of faith and service. And so I am for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be all made of fantasy, all made of passion, and all made of wishes, all adoration, duty, and observance, all humbleness, all patience and impatience, all purity, all trial, all obedience. And so I am for Phoebe. And so I am for Ganymede. And so I am for Rosalind. 
And so I am for no woman. If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? Why do you speak why blame you me to love you? Oh, uh, to her that is not here, nor doth not here. You know, I pray you no more of this. Tis like the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. Silvius, I will help you if I can. Phoebe, I would love you if I could. Tomorrow we will meet all together. Phoebe, I will marry you if ever I marry woman, and I'll be married tomorrow. Orlando, I will satisfy you if ever I satisfy man, and you shall be married tomorrow. Silvius, I will content you if what pleases you content you, and you shall be married tomorrow. Orlando, as you love Rosalind, meet. Silvius, as you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I'll meet. So fare you well. I have left you all commands. I'll not fail if I live. Nor I. Nor I. Scene four, the forest. Enter Duke Senior, Jakes, Orlando, Oliver, Celia as Eliana. Dost thou believe, Orlando, that the boy can do all this that he hath promised? I sometimes do believe and sometimes do not, as those that fear they hope and know they fear. <laughs> Enter Rosalind as Ganymede, Silvius, and Phoebe. Patience once more, whilst our compact is urged. You say, if I bring in your Rosalind, you will bestow her on Orlando here. That I would, had I kingdoms to give with her. And you say you will have her when I bring her. That would I, were I of all kingdoms kink. You say you'll marry me if I be willing. That will I, should I die the hour after. But if you do refuse to marry me, you'll give yourself to this most faithful shepherd. <sighs> so is the bargain. You say that you'll have Phoebe if she will. Though to have her and death were both one thing. I have promised to make all this matter even. Keep your word. Oh, Duke, to give your daughter, and you, yours, Orlando, to receive his daughter. Keep your word, Phoebe, that you'll marry me, or else refusing me to wed the shepherd. Keep your word, Silvius, that you'll marry her if she refuse me. And from hence I go to make all these doubts all even. I do remember in this shepherd boy some lively touches of my daughter's favor. My lord, uh, the first time I ever saw him, me thought he was a brother to your daughter. Uh, but my good lord, the boy is forest born and hath been tutored in the rudiments of many desperate studies by his uncle, whom he reports to be a great magician, obscured in the circle of this forest. Oh, there is sure another flood toward. <laughs> and these couples are coming to the ark. Here comes a pair of very strange beasts, which in all tongues are called fools. Salutations and greetings to you all. Good my lord, bid him welcome. This is the motley-minded gentleman that I have so often met in the forest. He hath been a courtier, he swears. <laughs> if any man doubt that, let him put me to purgation. <laughs> I have trod a measure. I, I have flattered a lady. I have been politic with my friends, uh, smooth with mine enemies. I have undone three tailors. I have had four quarrels. I would like to have fought one. And how was that taken up? We met and found the quarrel was upon the seventh cause. Oh, seventh cause. Good my lord, like this fellow. I like him very well. God, I'll do you, sir. I desire you of the like. I press in here, sir, amongst the rest of the country copulatives, to swear and to forswear according to marriage binds and blood breaks. Uh, a poor virgin, sir, an ill-favored thing, sir, but my own, a poor humor of mine, sir, to take that what no man else will. Rich honesty, Dwells like a miser, sir, in a poor house, as your pearl is in your foul oyster. By my faith, he is very swift and sententious. According to the fool's bolt, sir, and such dulcet diseases. Is not this 
a rare fellow, my lord. He's as good at anything, and yet a fool. He uses his folly like a, a stalking horse, and under the presentation of that, he shoots his wit. Enter Rosalind and Celia as themselves. Then is there mirth in heaven, when earthly things made even atone together. Receive thy daughter. Hymen from heaven brought her, yea, brought her hither that thou must, mightst join her hand with his whose heart within his bosom is. To you I give myself, for I am yours. To you I give myself, for I am yours. If there be truth in sight, you are my daughter. If there be truth in sight, you are my Rosalind. If sight and shape be true, why then, my love, adieu. I'll have no father if you be not he. I'll have no husband if you be not he. Nor ne'er wed woman if you be not she. Peace. Oh, <laughs> I bar confusion. Tis I must make conclusion of these most strange events. Here's eight that must take hands to join in Hymen's bands if truth hold true contents. You, Rosalind, and, and you, Orlando, no cross shall part. You, Celia, and you, Oliver, you and you are heart and heart. You, fool, and you are, are, are sure together as winter to foul weather, while a wedlock hymn we sing, feed yourselves with questioning. That reason wonder may diminish how thus we met and how these things finish. Ah, my dear niece, Welcome thou art to me, even daughter. Welcome in no less degree. I will not eat my word, now thou art mine. Thy faith my fancy to thee doth combine. Let me have a word or two. I am the second son of old Sir Royland, that bring these tidings to this fair assembly. Duke Frederick, hearing how that every day men of great worth resorted to this force, addressed a mighty power which were on foot in his own conduct proposedly to take his brother here and put him to the sword. And to the skirts of this wild wood he came, where, meeting with an old religious man after some question with him, was converted, both from his enterprise and from the world, his crown bequeathing to his banished brother, and all their lands restored to them again that were with him exiled. This to be true, I do engage my life. Welcome, young man. Thou offerest fairly to thy brother's wedding, to one his lands withheld, and to the other a land itself at large, a potent dukedom. First in this forest, we must do those ends that here were well begun and well begot. And after every of this happy number that have endured shrewd days and nights with us shall share the good of our returned fortune according to the measures of their states. Meantime, forget this new fallen dignity and fall into our rustic revelry. Play music and you brides and grooms all with measures heaped in joy to the measures fall. Sir, by your patience, if I heard you rightly, the Duke hath put on a religious life and thrown into neglect the pompous court. He hath. To him will I. Out of these convertites there is much matter to be heard and learned. You to your former honor I bequeath. <laughs> your patience and your virtue well deserves it. You to a love that your true faith doth merit. You to your land and great allies. You to a long and well-deserved bed. And you to wrangling. <laughs> For thy loving voyage is but two months victualed. So, to your pleasures, I am for other than for dancing measures. Stay, Jake, stay. 
Oh, to see no pastime, I. Which you would have, I'll stay to know at your abandoned cave. Proceed, proceed. We will begin these rites as we do trust they'll end in true delights. It is not the fashion to see the Lady the Epilogue, uh, but it is no, no more unhandsome than to see the Lord the Prologue. If it be true that a good wine needs no bush, tis true that a good play needs no epilogue. Yet a good wine they do use good bushes, and good plays prove better by the help of good epilogues. What a case I am in then, that I'm neither a good epilogue nor can insinuate with you in behalf of a good play. I'm not furnished like a beggar, therefore to beg will not become me. My way is to conjure you. And I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O oh, women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O oh men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering, none of you hates them, that between you and the woman, the play may please. If I were a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that pleased me, complexions that liked me, and breaths that I defied not. And I'm not sure, I'm sure as many have good beards or good faces or sweet breaths will, for my kind offer when I make curtsy, bid me farewell. End of play. <laughs>